the Literary City with Ramji Chandran, exclusively on IndigoMusic.com. Hello, I'm Ramji Chandran, and welcome back to the Literary City podcast on IndigoMusic.com. My guest today is a delightful Bangalorean and friend, Rupa Pai, author of Cubbon Park, The Green Heart of Bangalore. Now, with every move that some people in the city have to try and destroy Cubbon Park, books like Rupa Pai's are crucial to remind us what the park means to Bangalore emotionally. I talked to Rupa about Cubbon Park and her children's books as well, and what it's like to write philosophy for kids. What makes Cabin Park so important, so meaningful, and so beloved? More importantly, what makes it so central? For that word comes up a bizarre number of times when the park is being referenced to the city. Well, there is its physical location for one. Historically, the park lay at the intersection of two entirely different ways of life: the Bangalore Cantonment, administered by the British, and the Bangalore Peta, or city administered by the Maharaja of Mysore, making it a no man's land between oppressor and oppressed, soldiers and civilians, foreigners and natives, tea drinkers and coffee drinkers, largely church and mosque goers and largely temple goers, Tamil and Urdu speakers and Kannada speakers, the elite on both sides then as now spoke English. After independence, when city and cantonment were merged to create the new capital city of Mysore state, the park became a staging area for wary rapprochement, a safe space betwixt MG Road and KG Road. By and by, it also became the state's administrative centre, the nucleus around which the four pillars of democracy swirled. The judiciary, in the form of the Karnataka High Court, settled into the Athara Kacheri, the state's original administrative offices, its grounds stretching almost a kilometre along the park's western periphery. Both houses of legislature and the entire state cabinet moved into the Vidhan Sauda across the road. The executive occupied the rather unimaginatively named multi-storied building beside the Sauda. As for the fourth estate, it not only scattered itself in various locations around the park's boundaries, but also crossing the imaginary lines between competing publications met each evening to trade yarns and pot tips at the press club inside the park. And yet, Amid all the chaos that surrounded it, the park offered oases of silence and birdsong and dappled shade to those who needed it. Never entirely fenced about in its 152-year-old history, the park became Bangalore's meeting place, sanctuary and thoroughfare, a place the city went to and went through. It was thus, over the years, organically and effortlessly, that Cabin Park became central to the Bangalorean heart a welcoming buffer zone under an open liberal sky, a capacious green sink with an ability to subsume not only carbon dioxide, but also a diversity of ideas and opinions, the park has always been a space that carries in itself the very DNA of the city that Kempegowda built. And that's why this Bangalore institution, built of equal parts nostalgia, habit, and pure love, is the hero of this book. Which came first? Which influences which? Was it the intrinsically liberal nature of the native Kanadigas that imbued the park with its large-heartedness? Or is it that belligerents of every stripe lost their ire within the confines of this green cathedral? That is a question for the ages. But one thing is true. The very air of Kabin Park, its soil, its trees, its dwindling waters, is charged with the energy of its people the ones that birthed it into being, the ones that watch over it from their pedestals of stone, the ones that enhanced it in small and big ways, the ones that fight for it, the ones that care for it, and the ones that visit it and revel in it and love it. This book is as much about its people as it is about the park. As long as Bangaloreans, old and new, carry in their hearts the spirit of these verdant, welcoming acres, and are willing to stand up to anyone or anything that threatens it, this city will have nothing to fear. Different cities have different things that they buy into. In Paris, there's style. You never want to look sloppy in Paris. In New York, it's the energy of movement. 
Try walking slowly on the sidewalk and you'll risk having Fran Lebowitz come up and tell you, hey, pretend it's a city. In Bangalore, there is a buy-in to preserve trees. You can ride a motorcycle on a crowded sidewalk, drive up the wrong way on a one-way street and only mildly annoy others. But try trimming the branch of a tree in public and the passing Bangalorean will give you a sharp look and probably make a quick call to report you to the authorities. Indeed, most homes have trees and apartment buildings are sometimes built around an existing tree. Bangaloreans would not be surprised to see a new apartment building with a tree growing right through its floors. This isn't new though. Something about trees has found its way into the DNA of the city and indeed in us all. After all, in our DNA, we are part human, part city. And the sense of greenery has expressed itself in the city having two major botanically rich parks, Kaban Park and Lalbagh, each as large and as old as some of the greatest city parks in the world. Hyde Park in London, Gorky Park in Moscow, Central Park New York, and others. My guest Rupa Pai is the author of the book Kaban Park, The Green Heart of Bangalore. When Rupa was researching her book, she called and asked to interview me, and I said yes, of course, immediately. More than anything, it appealed to my sense of duty. I had been personally involved in an investigative story in my magazine, The Bangalore Monthly, about Cubbon Park, titled The Conspiracy to Kill Cubbon Park. The story was based on some builders and politicians who were spoiling to make that allegedly spoiling to parcel off this historic lung space to developers. I grew up in Bangalore. The park has been a part of my life. Rupa made me realize that I share a connection with people I probably will never meet. All of us have been alone with our deepest introspection when we experience the solitude of Cubbon Park, a bliss of birds and dogs, and oddly the company of a hundred other humans who exist and at the same time don't. Rupa Pai is a widely published author, having written several children's books, ranging from Indian mythology to economics. She is an engineer of computer science, a restaurant reviewer, and a sometimes travel writer. Her ability to deal with such diverse subjects comes from Rupa being a fascinating subject for an urban Petri dish, and beneath a charming and unassuming front, an incisive and perceptive mind. So let's find out all about her and about Cubbon Park. Rupa Pai, welcome to the Literary City. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's such a privilege to be here, Ramji. My privilege. <laughs> a reading of your various book titles alone indicates that you have the ability to write about a range of diverse subjects. So this, this goes to a certain innate understanding of learning, uh, epistemology, I believe it's called. I have had scholars of the old texts tell me, and I paraphrase, that the Holy Grail for ancient Indians was ultimate knowledge, and that is the ability to know everything. Do you know anything about this? I think what they meant by knowledge was not obviously book knowledge, but the knowledge of the truth. And what is that? And the truth is that uh, we, are all, we are all the same beneath whatever exterior uh, differences we have, external differences we have. And if we are able to do darshana, darshana is the main thing, is what we are pursuing. The, the ability to see beyond the external differences to the sameness in not only in every other human, but also in every other creature and tree and mountain and river. So I think that the unity of everything, that is what was the truth. And we are unable to see it because we are so caught up in the external differences. So this quest for ultimate knowledge through meditative introspection, mm -hmm. uh, such as standing on one leg in the forest for 14 years, what were they reaching out for? So I think like every other ancient thinker, you know, we associate our rishis somehow with religion. Uh, but actually they were just really deep thinkers, philosophers. And if you... I mean, actually, I would call them even scientists because it was all based on empirical information. And once they had realized that the material stuff around them did not satisfy them, did not truly bring happiness, 
they went looking for the answers to the existential questions like every human being in history and those questions never change and that's what makes these old texts so relevant even today because the questions they were dealing with were questions like who am i where did i come from where did the universe come from what is the purpose of my life and of course what happens after death that that question obsessed them and to find the answers to that they said you know there's no point looking outside because this is all just illusion delusion we get attached to it so much that we miss the truth which is actually inside of us and so they took off some sages are often thought of as being sort of selfish for having walked away from their families or whatever but in fact they were making this huge ultimate sacrifice to walk away from every comfort they had ever known from whatever status in society they had to begin again from scratch and uh, to try and find out the answers to these existential questions and then come back with the answers and share them with everybody else you write for children so is this something you can explain to an 8 year old actually yes because you know i think uh i, I think children are often underrated uh underestimated and i think for that reason something i have realized as a children's author in india uh when i look back about our tradition of storytelling for children uh what i have discovered is that there were no separate stories written for children very very seldom i mean the same stories were told to children as they were told to adults maybe they brought in animals like vishnu sharma brought in the panchatantra to make it easier for children to understand but the same truths were conveyed in a variety of different ways and the stories were the same i mean there nobody shied away shied away from telling the story of the mahabharata to children if children were part of the audience it's okay it was just uh the the philosophy was perhaps explained at a different level to children and to adults and i think that's possibly the reason why we don't have so much content for children even visually in india even today. we don't have so many children's films we don't have so much children's programming on ott platforms or television it's it's very much like they can understand and perhaps this comes from our understanding that children are only children in form and they are actually old old souls that are able to understand and in fact they retain their ability to be curious and to be open they already don't have filters in their mind that will you know resist what you're telling them so they are the kind of best kind of people to be able to give this wisdom to because they accept it without too much resistance and they are enriched by it i think so a while i have to use a conversational tone and uh, make sure there aren't too many big words but apart from that i think the the core the essence of what the great philosophies of india uh, are talking about i think a, ch- a child can get it that's very respectful of children <laughs> so when did you realize that you could write for children that's a very good question actually but i think i always as one of the lucky ones that always knew i wanted to write and i grew up of course like everybody else of my generation who was educated in english i and was a reader i grew up reading a lot of british books uh, in it like specifically mm-hmm. and while she was a fantastic storyteller and her language was wonderful and she was never preachy uh the problem with reading consuming so much in it blighton was that i grew up feeling that only british children had cool childhoods <laughs> and mine because it didn't resemble those at all somehow so you know so so i i began to because they were always away by themselves in the sunshine cycling somewhere boating somewhere having club meetings and then of course completely destroying criminals and bringing them to justice and the only time adults appeared was when the mom appeared with uh, squash and cookies uh, biscuits for the meeting uh, and left it outside she wasn't even allowed into the meeting room she didn't have the secret signal she didn't know the password of course yeah and the other time that adults appeared was when the policeman turned up to round up the criminals that these guys had caught and my life in india was the exact opposite with always too many adults around <laughs> too many adults around many of them i couldn't even identify but they were all part of my family and the writer wrote so evocatively about food and picnics and my picnics were always being you know dumped you know stuffed into an ambassador car and going to lalbagh and kapanpa i didn't even realize it was a problem until i was maybe 13 and i came across this fabulous indian children's magazine that was there then called target yeah target 
yeah target and it changed my life it flipped the switch because for once i was reading about children like myself and the way the writers wrote it it seemed like they were having a marvelous time as well that their life was wonderful so i needed someone to tell me that my life was wonderful to hold up a mirror and and then i said to myself that not only am i going to write for children i'm going to write indian stories for indian children so that no, another generation does not grow up feeling like somehow they are not represented somebody else's life is elsewhere i i didn't want them to feel that at all i wanted them to appreciate what a wonder it is to be an indian child i hear you now speaking of difficult concepts you wrote a book for children on economics and i'd like to quote from that economics as a branch of study didn't even exist 250 years ago coming to think of it neither did electricity sliced bread plastic selfies or the united states of america i take cause with sliced bread oh the king alfred baking spiders oh okay maybe <laughs> i read that book with some interest and i think that it just takes the most minor of edits to turn it into a book for adults wow. you know for people trying to learn the basics of economics like an economics for dummies or something yeah right right so you're an author of children's books you majored in computer science economics now how did you wade into that swamp that that again a nice question because i like answering that question because the fact that i waded into it was very surprising to me itself so i have to go back to the geeta for that the geeta for children uh i did not grow up, yeah i did not grow up in a home that even had a copy of the geeta so that kind of reverence that a lot of a lot of indians have for it i did not and and then i wrote it and then i sort of hit under the table because i was wondering what the reception would be for somebody who's not steeped in it to take on this task audacious task of not only retelling it but retelling it to a young and impressionable audience i thought the blowback would be huge uh in fact what happened was that it was embraced uh widely continues to be oh good yeah it's over 100000 copies sold now over a wow. year yeah it's crazy that's that's, fa- that's fantastic yeah it is and uh, a uk edition coming out in at the end at dipavali and all kinds of things translated into dutch apart from indian mm-hmm. languages so all kinds of good stuff happened and and because of that reception that the geeta got i said you know maybe this is a good time to tackle something else give me the confidence that i could go to a subject that i knew nothing about approach it with an open mind and humility uh you know willing it to tell me what it knew so that i could understand it and maybe it would speak to me so i said what is the one subject that i have never studied and know nothing about and everybody talks so knowledgeably about it and it sort of seems interesting uh, you know when people talk about it and i said economics and so i the first thing i did was ask for a ninth grade economics textbook icsc and i sat with it and then i read lots of other stuff and i said this is very interesting and that's how the book on economics came about with absolutely no background so books for children on mythology science economics and now a book for everyone about a park mm cubbon park mm the green heart of bangalore now what is it about a park that's so important we will take a break now and when i'm back Rupa Pai lists out reasons why a park, especially Cabin Park, is important to Bangaloreans. Green lung space aside, what is it about a park that's so important? So many things, but I think essentially it's a place where you can go and escape from the urban sprawl and chaos and feel at least for a few moments that you are within nature in a jungle. uh get to connect with yourself in the quiet and you know and and everything organic and natural around you i think i think it's a place a sanctuary i would say so it is it is really a very meditative thing to yeah. do to walk through the parks isn't yeah. it yeah and that's the reason why all the big cities in the world actually create big parks yeah now i i looked i really looked and i apologize to uh, whoever it is that i need to apologize to if i didn't find it I didn't find any other book about parks in Bangalore in uh, in India. Really? Any history of any parks? Yeah, I don't know. Do you know of any? I mean, Lal Bagh there are several 
books about oh no 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 bangalore uh, outside of bangalore oh outside of oh hi i know i don't know i haven't even looked but i can't nothing comes to mind well speaking of parks in india other than bangalore's two parks and delhi yeah. which has lodi gardens and uh, nehru park for example i don't know of many other parks i i never even thought about it yeah well good <laughs> okay. so let's talk about the world's great parks no for in fact mm. let's talk about just hyde park because there's a you know hyde park in london was actually um it built by henry the 8 oh. and he in 1536 remember this is the time can pick out of us wow oh, right right okay. it's about the same time right yeah anyway henry the 8th decided to grab a lot of land away from westminster abbey and that's significant also because that was the time of the separation yes. of church yes. and state and the whole henry the 8th's angst yeah and, and he yeah, uh, yeah. not only did he separate church from state but also separated land from church and he also separated his head his wife's head from I guess their bodies he did. Yeah. <laughs> so uh hyde park is older but still cubbon park is 152 years old and still it's not the oldest park in bangalore yeah lal bag is way older because hyder ali set it up so mid 18th century right 1760 i think but in fact it was much older than that correct yes 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 so at the same yeah. time as henry the 8th kimpe gowda grew yeah. flowers there they so they say that he grew roses red roses of red flowers for worship so many many it has morphed many times but kabun park has remained true to what it was meant to be when it started it was meant to be a people's park continues to be a people's park so bangalore has two great parks and you are the first to write a history mm-hmm. of cubbon park i know i don't know how it doesn't matter yeah. you're the first to do it and that's all counts i mean who yeah. has lived in bangalore and not felt an emotional connect to cubbon park oh absolutely and this is not only true of old bangaloreans ramji every new person who comes into the city eventually ends up in cabin park right and if they are from many other cities in india they have never seen a real park right i didn't think of that you know but it's probably true you're probably right and what what really pained me when i was writing this history was that we completely missed the 150th anniversary of the park 2 years ago no celebrations what would happen right. maybe there was some celebration planned i don't know but very early in the year we shut down because of covid so and for the first time cabin park shut down that was traumatic now uh, uh, may, uh, some people may or may not know that bangalore was actually always two cities until recently mm-hmm. one uh, owned and operated by the british and the yeah. other historically belonging to the uh, maharaja and the mysore kingdom now cabin park straddled the two now there's a there's a perception in bangalore that all the cantonment residents believe that cabin park belongs to the cantonment and the city people believe that lal bag is a city park but in fact cabin park also was in the maharaja's land wasn't it yes this is another thing i discovered that cabin park was the maharaja's uh, at some point it became that's why they had to remember when we talk about how gustav krumbigel krumbigel uh wanted to move the police station away from the victoria statue <laughs> yes the borders of nation had to be, had to be <laughs> redrawn yeah 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 and even victoria stands in maharaja's territory and gandhi ji stands in the cantonment mm. right opposite i mean i think that is a big symbol of bangalore itself now that is symbolic of the cooperative uh, sense of how the british and the maharaja worked on bangalore as one now, your book captures all of these things extremely well and you will illustrate how the politics of the day had a bearing on anything that was being decided upon in the park the statues the architecture the greenery so much yeah really is a part of yeah. the administration yeah. and continues to be completely yeah even as recently as the late 90s it took an activist judge michael saldana to actually issue suo moto orders to stop the complete destruction of the park it would have happened if he hadn't stepped in and did what he did the park was way bigger than you know the land defined as the park was way bigger than what we have as the park now so they were trying to build a legislators home i think right and in a very heartening manner yeah. the moment the city realized that there was this game of foot to try and uh, cause the destruction of the park activism came up and that's when people first knew that 
Cubbon Park even needed to be saved. I mean, the fun part of Cubbon Park was these impromptu music concerts that used to take place uh, on Sundays, yes. am I right? Yes. And you yes. had these kids, the cops looking on benignly as kids lit up joints and smoked pot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah. And ever right. since that time, activism has pretty much characterized Cubbon Park. Mm. I think it's a credit to the administration that Cubbon Park has remained yeah. a canine friendly park with a dog park. Right. Right? right. And, uh, you know, there are people who are running around trying to save, mm. uh, keep people from yeah. littering and leaving food packets lying around. And the underlying ethic is that there's a citizen's activity which is rising up to tackle everything about parks and both sides of the equation being handled right. all at once. Cool. Yeah. Running around. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yes. So at what point in time does activism stop it from being a people's park? Because too much of that can daunt people and just keep them away, right? Yes. I think the the good part is the uh, there are there is different kinds of activism and the pulls are in all directions i think that keeps the fulcrum stable because it's not only pulling in one direction as soon as somebody starts pulling in one direction somebody starts in the other direction so i think this constant push and pull will keep it good that, for all of us that's interesting yeah. that's really very well said if mm -hmm. i may now you concluded your reading with this paragraph this book is as much about its people as it is about the park. As long as Bangaloreans old and new carry in their hearts the spirit of these verdant, welcoming acres and are willing to stand up to anyone or anything that threatens it, this city will have nothing to fear. What does that mean? Are people still threatening the park? Oh, all the time. All the time. I mean, different agendas, basically. Some of the, the walkers perhaps don't want the dogs. The dog people, uh, you know, want the walkers to be friendlier towards the dogs and somebody wants, uh, you know, no vehicles to be there in the park. The other people want the vehicles to be allowed through the park, particularly the police, because they see it as a very important thoroughfare. If you cut that off, then, you know, we'll have even more congestion on the streets. So there are so many competing things. So in that sense, it's always under threat. Then there are people who want to uh, build more things inside the park, add some concrete, make it more walkable yeah so and there are other and people will say yeah we need more benches right we are older people we are walking in the park and there's no place to sit down if we start walking we can't sit down and then there are other people who say we don't want any more concrete in the park you know we not one bit because we want the mud paths to be mud paths but uneven mud paths are difficult for older people to walk on they would rather have a paved path so you know, there's so many competing things. So in that sense, it's always under threat. But I love that in 1998, what the activists did, uh, Michael Saldana, Vimal Desai, Explosity reporting on it, like putting them on the cover, bringing it uh, awareness. And I think TJ's George, he really gave it a lot of, lot of importance uh, on the front pages of his newspaper. So it sort of brought it into the public consciousness and people have now realized at least that generation of people realize that this is not something that we can just let go this is something that needs protection we all need to keep our little beady eyes on what is happening in the park so that we don't lose it um, and and the good part I think about Cabin Park even though I know that there are a lot of people who really want no traffic in the park I think personally, and I might be get a lot of hate for this, but I do think it's important to keep the traffic flowing in the park to some extent, because that is what keeps it alive in people's minds. The moment you put a wall around it, people forget that it exists. I think every, every time you drive through Kappen Park, you notice something, flowers are in blooms, and, and you say, this needs to be there, you know, we can't do without it. It's suddenly, it's such a drop in temperature, a drop in pressure, stress, as soon as you enter the park. I think it's important for people to experience that on an ongoing basis to build the love. Otherwise, they will forget it exists. And that characterizes your book. Your book is a labor of love. It truly is. It is my, it is my paean of love. It's a love song to the park. And on that wonderful note, Rupa Pai Thank you so much for being my guest on The Literary City. Thank you, Ramji. This was such a pleasure talking to you. You have been listening to Rupa Pai, columnist, writer, Bangalorean, and author of a wonderful book, Cabin Park, The Green Heart of Bangalore. 
Next week, I will be back with author and criminal Ahmed Naji, Egyptian who now lives in the United States. This is The Literary City with me, Ramji Chandran, on the always fun, always entertaining IndigoMusic.com. <laughs>